in relation to um, the events surrounding the birth of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, there are uh, eight different people that are mentioned that are associated with his birth um, or his coming, better way to put it, his coming into the world. He uh, is a pre-existent divine son of God and the Bible is very clear, he came into the world and uh, uh, he certainly was in existence before he was born. There's no question about that. But what we want to look at just by way of to get these things together, it's that time of the year, that uh, holiday season, and to put the scriptural teaching together and what we find in the Word of God to clear some things up and to uh, uh, straighten some things out. Now, um, first of all, uh, we want to deal with five men that are associated with the coming of Jesus into the world. Now, as we refer to it, maybe as uh, the birth of Christ or uh, five different men that were associated and mentioned when Jesus Christ came into uh, the world. First of all, uh, turn in your Bible, Luke chapter uh, 1. Now, in Luke chapter 1, we read here, uh, chronologically speaking, about uh, the first man in relation or associated with the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and that, of course, was uh, Zacharias. And we read uh, uh, about it in Luke chapter 1 and uh, look down in verse um, uh, 64, uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 64, and his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed and he spake and praised God. Now, um, this is referring to the father of John the Baptist. Now, and that of course was um, Zacharias and we read about him here in the word of God. Now, uh, he's uh, praising God that according to um, Zacharias, now, you see, uh, the Lord has come and he has visited man. Now, uh, look down in verse uh, 68. Now, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 68, the Bible says, Blessed, and this is Zacharias speaking, uh, uh, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath uh, visited and redeemed his people. So you see, he's praising God. Uh, he's giving glory to God that the Lord God of Israel hath visited and redeemed his uh, people. Then if you turn down to uh, verse 76, as we read here in the Word of God. In verse 76, this is a... Uh, very interesting study in the Word of God. And uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 76, And thou, child, uh, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before uh, the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Now, of course, this is speaking of the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that, of course, was uh, John the Baptist. But the Bible uh, says here, in Luke 1 and verse 76, thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And that was the ministry of John the Baptist as we read the word of God. Of course, the father of John the Baptist is uh, Zacharias. But you see, he'll go before the face of the Lord. Now, say that's the word for Jehovah God in the Bible, see, the Lord, he shall, uh, the Bible says, go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Now, turn in your Bible to, in the Old Testament, to Isaiah chapter 40. Now, in Isaiah chapter 40 and in verse 3, see, uh, not only was the Lord Jesus Christ prophesied that the Messiah would come, and we hear a lot of scripture and a lot of verses about the Messiah and the coming of the Lord, obviously, as we study the Word of God. But now, you see, the ministry of John the Baptist was also 
foretold in the Old Testament. Now, in Isaiah chapter uh, 40, and we read here in uh, verse 3, the Bible says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Now, this is speaking of John the Baptist. See, and it says here what Zach, uh, Zacharias is quoting there in the Word of God in the passage we just read in Luke uh, chapter 1 uh, uh, is the Bible says here, he's preparing the way of the Lord. Now, make straight uh, in the desert a highway for our God. Now, the significance there in the Word of God is that that's the word for Jehovah God, the Lord in the Old Testament. Now, you come to the New Testament, and that refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see there the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in relation to what was prophesied in relation to John the Baptist. Now, turn over to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, again, you have uh, the ministry of John the Baptist foretold here in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. Behold, uh, Malachi 3 and verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, um, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Now, see, these words for the Lord in the Old Testament are the words for Jehovah God. You see, the Lord. Now, as you turn back to Luke chapter 1 and verse 76, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of, you see, the Lord to prepare his way. So now, what we have here in the Word of God, you see, is that uh, Jesus is referred to as the Lord of the Old Testament. How do we get that? See, bo both in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, see, that's the word for the Lord God in the Old Testament. So we see that very clear in the Word of God. By the way, that's a great verse to uh, remind us of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ, according to this verse, is the God of the Old Testament. Now, in verse uh, 77 of Luke chapter 1, the Bible uh, says here, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their uh, sin. So, see, uh, Zacharias is praising the Lord. He's giving glory uh, to the Lord, you see, because now uh, John the Baptist will be, uh, is now born, and, you see, the Messiah has come, and the Messiah will forgive us of our sins and tell us how to be forgiven of our sins. Now, in verse 79 of Luke chapter 1, to give light to them that sit in darkness, in the shadow of death. And what was the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, to give light, uh, spiritual light, to the world that is in darkness. Now, see, the world is in darkness. The Messiah comes to give light to those that are in darkness in uh, the world. So what you have here, number one, is you have Zacharias. Now, uh, one of the men that is definitely, according to the Word of God, see, associated with uh, the coming of the Messiah into the world. See, and John the Baptist is the forerunner. Zach uh, Zacharias is his father. And then he gives this tremendous uh, annunciation that the Messiah has come. He has visited his people. The Messiah, the Lord God, has come into uh, the world. Now, you might say that was the uh, first man, uh, chronologically speaking, that we read about in the Word of God in relation to the birth of the Messiah, uh, the Savior of the world. Now, as you turn over a page to Luke chapter 2, we read here about 
uh, the shepherds. Now, this is the, you might say, the second group of men that are associated, see, with the birth of our uh, Savior. And we all like to read and study about uh, the, uh, the uh, shepherds. Now, in Luke chapter 2, and behold, there was, um, or Luke chapter uh, 2 and verse 8, and there were in the same country, Luke 2 and verse 8, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, see, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said, and usually whenever you have the angel appearing, the angel of the Lord appearing to someone, they always uh, have to calm them down and say, fear not, uh, in verse 10. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, you see, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So now these lowly, despised shepherds. And during that time, that was a very lowly job. They were looked down upon. They were usually very uh, poor and insignificant and at the bottom of the, the ladder in relation uh, to um, uh, finances. So uh, they're usually poor, uh, very humble, very obscure people in relation to the shepherds here. That's what this uh, 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 job of the shep shepherd uh, developed into, a lot different than you read about the shepherd in the Old Testament, uh, David and uh, Moses and these great shepherds in the Old Testament. But he says here in verse 11, he says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David, say, a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Now, as you look down in Luke chapter 2 and in verse 20, and the shepherds return, say, glorifying and praising God. Say, now, number one, Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, He's praising God. He's glorifying God that uh, the Messiah, the Savior, has now come. Now, uh, we read here about the shepherds and their reaction to going. And I saw the baby in the manger, literally in the manger there. And in verse 20 of Luke chapter 2, And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto uh, them Now, and what uh, the Lord revealed to the lowly shepherds was that now, you see, the Savior is born. For Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, see, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That's the emphasis of Christ coming into the world. Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 1.15, came into the world to save sinners. So, see, number one, you have uh, Zacharias, and then uh, uh, the second men, or group of men, we read about in relation to the Messiah coming into the world, is the shepherds, and it's very clearly told them that the Savior is born. You see, uh, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then we find that they're glorifying and they're uh, praising the Lord. Now, as we um, uh, fast forward things a little bit, the third group of people or men that are mentioned in the Word of God are the wise men. Now, and of course, they're found in Matthew chapter uh, 2. And there we read about the wise men. And uh, the Bible says in verse 2, uh, saying they came to Jerusalem, uh, they came from far away, uh, most everybody believes they traveled a minimum of 700 miles, probably 1,000 miles. And uh, there's a, a lot of tradition about the wise men that is totally unbiblical. For instance, a lot of people think there were three wise men. We have that song, I think it might even be in our hymn book, We Three Kings of Orient Are. Well, number one, there was not three, 
And number two, they were not kings, see, according uh, to the Bible. Now, you go to some churches and they actually give the names. of the. They say there are three, and they'll mention the name. They mention this name, that name, and the other name. And they say all of that, of course, is tradition. Why? It's not found in the Bible. But they say, oh, these are the three names, and they give the names and have the pageants uh, uh, around the uh, Christmas time and so forth. And then the other thing about these men is that we don't know how many there were. Uh, the Bible mentions wise men, plural. It could have been two, could have been ten, could have been twenty. We don't know. And why don't we know uh, how many there were? Because the Bible doesn't say how many uh, there, there were. Now, we know they gave three gifts to the Lord. So a lot of people say they gave three gifts to the Lord, but even that doesn't indicate there were three because it, it was out of their treasury. See, they had a, a, this treasury uh, uh, with uh, them. And then the other thing, they were Gentiles. See, they were not Jews. They were uh, uh, Gentiles. And, but you see, as you read about these men in the Word of God, it, it says we have come, see, to worship Him. And then uh, um, as you look down in uh, verse 8 of Luke chapter or Matthew chapter 2, of course, the story uh, uh, of the birth of Christ given in Matthew and in Luke. But here in Matthew, we read about the wise men. And in verse 8, and the Bible says, He sent them to the Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me a word again that I may come and worship him also. Now, of course, Herod wants to uh, murder the Lord Jesus Christ, but he says, you know, I want to worship him. Again, one of the biggest hypocr hypocrites we read about in the Word of God. And then in chapter 2 of Matthew and verse 11, and when they were come into, see, the house. Now, again, as we think of uh, the story of the coming of the Savior into the world, they did not go to the manger. Now, of course, uh, the shepherds went to the manger. They saw the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. That was a sign. And, um, but now, see, now the Bible says here, they came into the house. So now they are in some type of a dwelling. And then the Bible says they saw, see, the young child. See, not the baby, uh, the young uh, child with Mary, his mother, and that, that now, see, here's the third incident in the Bible of people worshiping and praising the Lord as a result of the Savior coming into the world. And then the Bible says they fell down and they worshiped Him. Now, again, very instructive in the Word of God, they did not worship Mary. See, they did not praise Mary. They did not glorify Mary. See what it says here? They fell down and they worshiped Him. Very instructive in the Word of God. Why? Because the Bible is very clear that only God is to be worshipped. Now, this is the first of many times in the Gospel of uh, Matthew where it says, and they worshipped Him. You read through the book of Matthew, and there's about nine times that that phrase is used on different occasions where it says that they worshipped Him. You see, now the Bible is very clear. Only God is to be worshipped. And again, this is a great indication of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that He was God who became a man. And so the Bible says they worshipped Him. They actually worshipped Him. And the Bible says, and when they had opened their treasuries, now uh, the treasure that they had with them, again, as we mentioned in previous studies, they were very, very wealthy. No question about that. Uh, evidently very influential men, but they uh, opened their treasuries and they printed, uh, presented unto him gifts of uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, everybody and all the commentators, all everybody studies this passage, they say, well, uh, that is symbolic. You see, it is not symbolic. That is a uh, erroneous interpretation of the Word of God. This has nothing to do with symbolism. This is talking about the birth of Christ. And you're talking about some very wealthy men who came and they gave him these gifts. And those gifts were simply 
the money exchange of the day. And a lot of times that is overlooked. Here's a great verse in the Bible about worship. And one of the aspects of worship in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, has to do with our giving uh, uh, of our means, our money, unto the Lord. So, now, in other words, you don't read a verse like that, say, oh, that has a symbolic meaning. No, it has a literal meaning. In other words, see, they literally came and they gave, the Bible says, unto Him. Now, uh, to Jesus, see, they're worshiping Him, gifts of gold, frankincense, and uh, myrrh. Now, you see, that was a common monetary exchange of the day. That was the money of the day. How did they travel a thousand miles? See, uh, where did they get money uh, for food? I'm sure, again, I'm sure they had the Navy SEALs, the Green Berets with them, protecting them. Uh, again, uh, we have these three, in, in most tradition, uh, these uh, three men coming on camels and uh, into uh, the uh, uh, city of Jerusalem. By the way, uh, I'm told that if they were from that area where the Bible indicates they were from, they would be riding some of the greatest uh, horses of the day. See, well-trained, and those horses today from that area of the world, see, the Arabian stallions and those type uh, of things. But whatever, you see, uh, they came to Jerusalem, and the Bible said, Herod trembled, and the Bible says the whole city trembled when they came. They, again, these are not three ragamuffins coming in to the city of Jerusalem. If they were, why would everybody uh, be trembling in the city? So they had their guards and these different ones that would have been with them uh, coming. But now, you see what I'm saying. See, they literally gave him gold. See, they literally gave him frankincense and myrrh. Now, and we know, and I'm sure most all uh, Bible teachers are agreed, see, this was the money that enabled Mary and Joseph to go down to Egypt. And they were there for quite a while before God told them to go back to uh, uh, Israel. Now, see, where they get the money to support themselves, they were poor, and here's where they got the money to support themselves for quite a while. See, or at least to go down into Egypt before they could get established, or Joseph was a carpenter before he could get a job or open a carpenter shop or whatever. See, this was the money that enabled them to go down there. Now, this is a great lesson in the providence of God. Here, Mary and Joseph and the baby basically are very poor and they're penniless. Now, see, in the providence of God, probably many, many months before, God puts it in the heart of these men to follow that Shekinah glory star and find the baby that was uh, born, the Messiah of the world. Now, say that's the providence of God. See the timing. By the way, you see the providence of God is written all over the story here of the Savior coming in to the world. For instance, um, as we digress just a moment, who was responsible for having Mary and Joseph come to the city of Bethlehem? So, yeah, and uh, well, that's what you read there in Luke chapter 2. Now, uh, was he a saved man or an unsaved man? He was an unsaved man. Now, uh, did he know that he was fulfilling Bible prophecy by requiring not only Mary and Joseph, but a lot of others to go to the uh, city of their uh, original ancestors for the census and so forth. Say, now here's an unsaved man. Here is a wicked man, and yet God uses an unsaved, wicked man to bring about the great prophecy that the Messiah would be born in the city of Bethlehem. And that was an unsaved man that made that decree about the census. See, so that uh, the baby would be born, according to Bible prophecy, the baby had to be born in Bethlehem. No question about that, as we study Bible prophecy in the Old Testament. Now, another thing 
uh, as you think of the providence of God, see, and uh, what we mean by that, God overruling, sort of taking charge um, uh, in spite of us and doing things that we can't figure out, and God is at work even though sometimes we don't know He's at work and can't figure out how He is uh, working. Now, can somebody tell me how far is Nazareth from Bethlehem? How far is the city of Nazareth where they lived to the city of Bethlehem? See, they came from Nazareth to the city of Bethlehem. Anybody know approximately how far Nazareth is from Bethlehem? I think it's yes, three to five miles. Excuse me? Three to five miles. No, no, not at all. Seventy miles. Seventy miles. Now, the uh, custom of the day was that if you were poor, you didn't ride a camel, you didn't ride a donkey, because those things cost money, and, um, and you have to feed them and so forth. So the indication is, because of that, say Mary and Joseph walked from Nazareth to Bethlehem. You're talking 70 miles. By the way, here's where uh, Bible geography gets us into to really interesting study in the Word of God. So now, you see, it's a 70-mile journey. Now, I don't know how many miles they walked each day, but I'm sure it took them several days to walk from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem. I don't know. Uh, anybody have any idea how many miles a person could comfortably walk uh, in a day? And they probably went with a caravan or probably other people involved, relatives, whatever, and uh, uh, so forth. But um, now here's the, uh, the intriguing thing. She was expecting a baby. She was pregnant. Now, she has to travel with Joseph 70 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Suppose the baby was born five miles outside of Bethlehem. See, then that would not have fulfilled the scripture. See, then the prophecy would not have been uh, fulfilled. Here is a woman ready to give birth, and now she makes a journey of 70 miles. And you see, in the providence of God, God made sure the baby was born not a mile or two from Bethlehem, not a, a few miles up the road, uh, to in in around Jerusalem, but you say in according say this amazing thing of Bible prophecy. Say uh, the baby had to be born according to Bible prophecy, but praise God, the baby was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Say that's the providence of God. So the providence of God is written all over uh, the birth of the Messiah, as the Bible says, in the fullness of time. Galatians 4, 4. Say, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. See, it was all planned at that uh, particular uh, uh, time. So we see the, the providence of God here. But now what we're uh, thinking, getting back, see, they presented to Him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Let's do a little figuring here. How much is an ounce of gold worth today? One ounce is worth how much today? $1,900. Okay, $1,900. Okay, you go back down to Mary and Joseph in the Bible. So you see, now, now, see, these men are worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. See, they're really honoring and glorifying uh, Him. And the Bible says they gave Him gifts of gold. And so these men would have been extremely generous in relation to the amount of gold that they gave in their worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how much gold do you think they uh, gave uh, to the baby? Of course, uh, uh, Joseph would have taken care of it. 
Yeah, any thought how much gold they may have uh, given? See, if you were, you, say you were the wise men or uh, the women, you were a wise woman. You traveled a thousand miles, and uh, this is of God to worship uh, the Savior who's now come into the world, and you're very rich, you're very wealthy, because they had to be wealthy, and obviously, as you read here in the Word of God, uh, how much gold do you think they would have given uh, Jesus? How much? I, I would say at least one gold bar. I said at least a gold bar. And uh, uh, how much do you think that would have weighed? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you were there and you were real rich and you had a lot of gold, how much gold would you have given to Jesus? <laughs> Say, how, how much? W w would you chipped off a piece of gold? And say, you know, here, this is just a, an eighth of a little piece of gold. I'll just give them a little. Uh, no, how, how much do you think you, uh, they give, uh, you, you would have given them? Or how much do you think they would have given them? Any, any thought? Say they gave him. Well, see, we don't know. We're just speculating. But we're putting ourselves in the, in the position of the wise men. Amen? Now, these are. Uh, men that love the Lord, they traveled for many, many months. They're very wealthy men because they couldn't have traveled, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they would have been wealthy men. So how much gold do you think they gave uh, him? If you were a wise man or uh, you were a wise woman, how, many, uh, how much gold do you think uh, you, they would have given? See, and it says they took it out of their treasury. See, so that means they had uh, literally a treasure box. They had literally a bank with them. See, they were traveling with what we would uh, refer to, see, as a bank. That's why they'd have to have guards and military men guarding them so the thieves wouldn't get them and so forth. But how much, uh, anybody have just, uh, uh, you want to take a guess at, uh, I don't know. Um, by the way, I'm not into gold, so, uh, <laughs> but uh, anybody have a thought? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but how much weight do you think? Say, uh, say they gave him a pound of gold by way of illustration. Now, there's, I think there's still supposed to be 16 ounces to the pound right now, uh, except if you go to the grocery store, you find out a little, sometimes a little different. But uh, today, but okay, so how much if they gave him a pound of gold, and you say it's $19 an ounce, one pound would equal how much money? Around 30,000. Okay, oh, let's specifically how much? 19 times 16. That would come out to almost, what, $24,000? Uh, almost uh, 30,000. Twenty-four. Okay, and then okay. Now that's the gold. Now the Bible uh, says here, and then you have the frankincense. Now uh, I am told that the frankincense was probably worth, at that time, putting everything together, four thousand dollars. A pound. See, these spices and so forth. You go to the store and you check out those little bottles. If you check out, see, they're just giving you a very little amount. They're very expensive. But anyway, um, that would be uh, $4,000 a pound. Suppose they gave him a pound. Then that would bring it up to what? $28,000. And then the Bible uh, says here, myrrh. Now, I'm told that the myrrh uh, back then would be the equivalent today of about $500 a pound. So, see, that brings it, you put all three together, it brings it right around $30,000. Now, if they gave him a pound. Now, uh, they, they may have given him, you know, a pound is not much, but they probably 
I don't know, the Bible doesn't say, maybe giving him a lot more. But by the way, see, here's a great lesson in relation to the matter of giving. One of the first lessons in giving in the Word of God, in the Gospels, and the Bible always teach, it teaches that our, uh, our giving ought to be generous. We ought to be generous in our giving. We ought to be liberal in our giving. The only reason why I bring that out is that, see, these wise men worshipped him. Now, how much gold did they give him? I don't know. How much frankincense did they give him? I don't know. How much myrrh did uh, they give him? I don't know. But the thing we do know, all three of those things were immensely valuable. They were valuable commodities. Like, uh, even today, I believe some people have indicated, even today, these things are worth a lot of money Today, not only the gold, but the uh, frankincense and uh, uh, the, the myrrh. But see, uh, this next group of men that come, see, they come to the Savior and they are worshiping Him. You see, and uh, the Bible is very clear here, uh, they worshiped uh, the Lord. And then uh, um, the third man that we read about, uh, or the fourth man, see, we have Zacharias, you have five men that are mentioned in relation to the birth of uh, the Savior. Say, we have Zacharias, we have the shepherds, we have the wise men. And then in Luke chapter 2, and um, in verse uh, uh, 26, we read here about this very interesting man in the Word of God by the name of Simeon. Now, after Jesus was 40 days old, he was to be brought to the temple for a purification ceremony for Mary and some type of a dedication of uh, the baby. So now, 40 days later, after his birth, in Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. Simeon. And the, uh, the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And waiting for the consolation of Israel, I believe that's simply a way of saying he was waiting for the Messiah to come. Now, as you read about this story and as we study on uh, and, and so forth, you study about it, say there were some people in the nation of Israel, Jewish people, who were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Great lesson for us today. You and I ought to be looking forward to his second coming. Amen. Praise God. He could come at any moment. But the Bible says um, he was devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was received. Now, he's in the temple. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen Say, the Lord's Christ, and Christ is the word for Messiah. So God revealed uh, to him that he would not die before he saw the Messiah come into the world. Boy, that'd be great if we had a promise, amen, where we knew the, the, in the second coming of Christ that we wouldn't die and we'd actually live to see a second coming. Well, we don't have that promise, but here uh, the Lord promised that you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. A lot of devotional thought along that line. Uh, but then in verse 27, And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus, see where they were there for this purification, dedication cer uh, uh, ceremony, uh, they brought in the child Jesus to do for him after, see, the law, the custom of the law. This is taught uh, in the Old Testament. And then... Uh, uh, took he him up in his arms and blessed God. So now you have another man that's involved in relation to the Messiah coming into the world, the Savior coming to the world. And see, he's praising God, he's blessing God. And um, in verse 29 of Luke chapter 2, he said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. You see, for mine eyes have seen Say, thy salvation. And what you have uh, in relation to all these people, whether it's Zacharias, uh, whether it's the shepherds, whether it's the wise men, say, he is the Savior. The Messiah has now 
come into the world. And then, as he says here, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. See, uh, this is the one that will save people from their sin. This is the one that brings salvation into the world. Now, in verse 31, which thou hast prepared before the face, say, not only of the Jew, but all people. Say, anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. And then as he says in verse 32, say, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and then the glory of thy people uh, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. See, they, they were blessed and encouraged. And uh, here this uh, Simeon is giving uh, this great blessing upon them. And then in verse 34, And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Now, what's that mean? See, uh, what Simeon is prophesying here is not that Jesus Christ, contrary to a lot of teaching around Christmas season, he is not coming to bring peace into the world. Jesus Christ is coming, and as a result of his coming, he will bring division. Now, see what it says here. Uh, said for the fall. That means uh, people will not receive him. As a result of that, uh, they will undergo the judgment of God in the future. And then the Bible says the rising again. Those who humble themselves and uh, receive him as their Savior, those people will be saved. And then... Uh, you see, a sign which shall be spoken against. See, a lot of people are going to speak against Jesus Christ. And we see that in the gospel, amen? See, over and over and again. See, as you read in John chapter 1. See, he came unto his own, and what's the Bible say? See, his own received him not. See, he came into the world that he created, but the world did not receive him. So he's a sign which shall be spoken against. See, and that is just as true today as it was then. Now, in what sense? See, see, Jesus Christ divides. There are those that hate Jesus Christ. There are those that will not follow him. There are those that um, will not humble themselves in his presence. So what Simeon is saying here See, in the language that he uses, there will be those who will be saved and those who will not be saved. Basically, by way of impl implication, there will be those who will love the Savior and there will be those who will hate the Savior. And this is all uh, when he's 40 days old. Now, uh, in verse 35, it says, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Now, what do we read here in the Word of God? See, now we find here that Mary is going to undergo a lot of difficulty in her life. She's going to undergo a lot of pain and a lot of sorrow. See, and a sword shall pierce through thine own soul. Soul. By the way, the word sword here is not talking about the small sword. It's talking about the large uh, sword. That Mary is going to have a, a sword, the Bible says here, pierce through thine own soul uh, uh, also. And referring to the fact that Mary was there at the cross, John 19 and verse 25 says that Mary stood by the cross and she, she saw her son, Jesus, crucified on that cross. The boy that uh, God used through the miraculous virgin birth conceived by the Holy Spirit to bring into the world. The one whose diapers she changed. The one who fed that little boy. And then as he was being brought up, I'm sure many times she'd sit there in the house and look out uh, there and see uh, Joseph, his father, uh, stepfather, of course, not biological father, but his father, and working there in the carpenter's shop. 
And I'm sure Mary would think and contemplate here the, the miraculous birth, the virgin birth, the Savior. He's going to be uh, the Savior. And all those thoughts would go through her mind and uh, keep in mind she was the earthly mother, the woman, as we mentioned, uh, the epitome, great example in humility in the Word of God, being a good wife, being a good mother, and the example of humility in the Word of God is Mary, just like Joseph is the uh, epitome of a good father, a good um, husband, and someone who totally obeyed the Lord. But you see, imagine how Mary felt as she saw Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross. It was like a, a big sword split right into her uh, chest. You see, uh, the sorrow, the pain that she experienced in watching, and she'd remember, I remember when he was 10 years old, when he was 12 years old, when he was 15, when he was 20, and uh, all those thoughts would go through Mary's mind. Again, see, people in the Bible are not robots. There's no robots in the Bible. They're human. And, and see, Simeon says, see, that big sword's going to pierce right through your chest. You're going to, see, now, see, this is the other side of the teaching about the Savior coming into the world. Not everybody's going to receive him. There will be those who will reject him. You see, and then uh, there's going to be a lot of sorrow in the life of Mary when she stands there at the cross and sees uh, the Lord Jesus Christ crucified on uh, the cross. We read about that in uh, John 19 and verse uh, 25. She was there at the cross and where Jesus uh, told John uh, to now look upon her as his, uh, your mother and take care of her, which again, an indication that uh, Joseph had already uh, died and was not alive at that time. And if he was, uh, obviously, uh, Jesus would have not said that to John in John chapter uh, 19 and uh, uh, verse uh, 25. By the way, this is the first mention in the Gospel of Luke of the cross, of the death of Jesus Christ. Say, Mary, that sword's going to pierce you. Say, so you're going to undergo a lot of sorrow, you see, especially in relation to Calvary and especially in relation to the cross. How do you think Mary felt on her way home from the cross? See, again, no robots in the Bible. I'm sure John and Mary were overwhelmed with grief and sorrow. See, imagine how Mary would have slept that night. I don't think she slept that night. I think she would have cried the whole night through, amen? You see, but now, see, this was prophesied in relation to Mary. But now he goes on and he says that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now, what this is indicating here in the Word of God is that, and, and in the context here, what this is actually talking about is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's when Mary, the Bible uh, teaches here, shall, uh, the sword shall pierce through thine own soul. I believe that's talking about the cross and Calvary, and uh, that, that the th thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. See, every person, what goes on in their heart of every person is the result of how they look upon Calvary. See, if someone accepts that sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, they're saved, they become a child of God. Someone rejects that sacrifice that he made on the cross of Calvary, you see, and that reveals where they are in their heart. They're either for the Savior or they are against the Savior. Now, one is a determining factor 
in relation to whether somebody is for the Lord or against the Lord. See, it has to do with Calvary. It has to do with what he did on the cross of Calvary. And that reveals whether I am a follower of Jesus Christ or I am a rejecter of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, see, here's uh, the fourth man that we read about. See, we read about Zacharias. We read about the shepherds. read about the wise men. We read about uh, Simeon. And who's the man that we left out? The most obvious man that we left out. The five men that are associated with the coming of the Savior into the world. And the one we did not mention was Joseph. Now, and the reason why we did not mention Joseph, and he's the fifth one, by the way. See, Zacharias, the shepherds, wise men, uh, Simeon, and then Joseph. Because, see, all of these individuals praise the Lord. See, Simeon praised the Lord. He blessed the Lord. He rejoiced uh, in the Lord. See, the wise men, they came, they worshiped, they praised uh, the Lord. The shepherds were praising God, the Bible says. And uh, Zacharias, see, he uh, is bursting in praise to God that, uh, uh, that the Messiah would finally come into the world. But now, when it comes to Joseph, an interesting thing in the Bible, there's no record in the Bible that Joseph ever said anything. Now, we, the, the wise men spoke. They said, uh, we come to worship him. Where, you know, where, where uh, is he at? See, uh, Simeon spoke. See, the wise men uh, uh, spoke. The shepherds spoke. And Zacharias spoke. You see, but not one mention of anything that Joseph ever said. That's interesting, isn't it? It's intriguing as you study uh, uh, the word of, uh, of God. But, you see, what you do learn about Joseph, see, he never said anything uh, in, in relation to the Word of God. But every time God, through the angel, ever told Joseph to do anything, he immediately did it. See, remember Joseph said, well, I'm not sure about this uh, pregnancy uh, of Mary. You say, and remember he wanted to put her away. God spoke, <laughs> spoke to him. Then immediately he took her in as his wife. And then God spoke to uh, Joseph about the fact that uh, Herod wanted to murder the baby Jesus. See, and Joseph saves his life. And the Bible says the same night, say, he didn't wait till morning. The same night he went and he... Uh, uh, took the baby and they fled in Egypt. And then, uh, what, the next day, Herod has all the babies in Bethlehem, under two years old, uh, murdered. And then God spoke to him again and said, okay, now Herod is dead. Now it's time to go back uh, to Israel. So a very interesting uh, person in the Bible. See, he never says anything. Yet, the thing that we see about Joseph he is always obeying God, and he's always immediately doing what God uh, told him uh, to do. So what we have here, see, are five men in the Bible that are associated with the coming of the Savior into the world. So you have Zacharias, you have the shepherds, you have the wise men, you have Simeon, and then you have uh, Joseph. Now, we don't have time to go into it. But uh, the Lord willing, next week, we'll look at the three, not two, but three women that are associated with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three different women that we read about. So there were five men, and there are three women that are associated with the birth of the Savior into the world. Now... By way of homework, and we'll give a little uh, homework, and that is, who were those three women? Say, the three women. Now, most everybody knows two, but the third one also. Say, who are the three women? And for homework, and this will get us into a very interesting study in the Word of God, because, see, 
uh, sometimes people say, well, when the Bible says uh, Jesus had brothers and sisters, that means that uh, they were not brothers and sisters, yet it's the word brothers and it's the word sisters, and that's the only way those words are used in the Bible, literal brothers and literal uh, sisters. So now, the second study question would be, how was Mary related to Elizabeth? How were those two, now according to the Bible now, say so study the Bible and see what the Bible says about the word that is used there in the Bible for the relationship between Mary and Elizabeth and what the Bible says about that. That'll open up a lot of doors and help us to really understand the Bible in a, a better way. Well, I trust that God will uh, speak to our hearts. Say five men and three women, and that's the entire uh, story of the birth of Christ. There are five men associated uh, with the birth of uh, the Savior, and there are three women that we read about uh, in the account of the birth of uh, the Savior. Let's.